I think it's very important for people to think objectively, to have a little bit of cr critical thinking, perhaps open-mindedness, as opposed to automatically just black and white, the book says this, and that's it. Um, if somebody's sincere, they're going to be very cautious and careful about what they say and they believe, and they're going to understand something about what Father Seraphim Rose says concerning orthodoxy of the mind and orthodoxy of the heart. I think that the tables have turned somewhat, and I see that there are certain apologists on the side of the modernistic jurisdictions who don't understand orthodoxy of the, of the heart. Of course, I think we need to have orthodoxy of the mind and orthodoxy of the heart connected because that would be a true application and true offering and true um, reality, a lived thing, which would, which would show us, verify in us, the truth of where we are, and it would help us to understand that only through the Orthodox faith can we receive sanctification in, in the Orthodox Church. And Mitch Paul, that Anthony Grabovitsky says that he says concerning heretics and people that are stubbornly opposed to the church and church order, that um, they nothing that you say will convince them. Even if one were to rise from the dead, as it says in scriptures, you will not convince them. Um, you know, we've spoken so much about this miracle that happened in 1925 concerning the cross, and people have a whole bunch of different reasons why they don't want to accept it, or perhaps they do accept it because you can't deny it, but um, they just look at it in a very, diff very different way from what the 2,000 people who were present saw and got from, from this miracle. So I think that one has to fall on their knees a little more and ask God for illumination lest we sin. And sometimes we have people who are spokesmen for these conservative modernists, if you will, who say that um, we should see what the saints say. So in my last video, I, I quoted some of what some saints said, and we have more to say concerning that. God willing, in the future, we'll hear concerning that. But to answer your question, I grew up in Rokor, and eventually we joined some of these Greek old calendars. And <laughs> um, a lot of people basically saw a great link between the so-called Greek old calendars, and the roll car. There, there's a link because, first of all, the ordinations came from roll car, but then roll car um, eventually totally recognized um, the church of the GOC as a sister church, and even right up until the end, just before the union with the Moscow Patriarchate, um, they, they, that's how they considered us. And, in fact, to prove that, we have living examples. In other words, we have clergy that joined us from the Rokor basically on the eve of the union between Rokor and Moscow and the Moscow Patriarchate um, with a canonical release from Vladika Lavra, who was very much for the union. So I think that some people, at least in Rokor, would probably, those who know their history, should probably be a lot more objective and understand us and who we are because they know their old Rokor. And the old Rokor um, most likely would not have been ready for this union with the Moscow Patriarchate. And there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, one of the things that the Rokor hierarchs kept saying was that, that the Moscow Patriarchate needs to repent seriously before any type of a union could happen. And <clears throat> although things are not as bad as they were during the Soviet times, there was a, a, a great fall. And uh, that's the way that the, that the, this is the way that the Rokor saw it. And so, let me give you an example here. Um, Patriarch Kirill, who is the pr present day Patriarch of, of Moscow, um, is seen in a photograph underneath a great big statue of Metropolitan Sergius, and he's standing together with President Putin. So the old Rokor would have a problem with that. They would not be able to uh, stomach that. 
Um, probably, I assume that even some people in Rokor MP right now have a problem with that. And, and as I said, those are the ones that probably know something about their history and remember their old fathers. So we have people who have no connection with Rokor that are quoting some of the Rokor hierarchs, but really misrepresenting them and not really understanding their spirit, just not understanding what Rokor stood for. Rokor was a light. Rokor was the, the Church of Christ, and it was a shining light because um, they brought holiness out of Russia and planted it here. <laughs> so we have to recognize that, especially for those of us in our sacred metropolis here. Uh, because, as I've said many times before, the Church is not, is not ethnic. That's what we believe. That's what my synod in Greece believes. But the Church is local. And so here, in our local metropolis, we had holy people. And it behooves us to honor their memory. And by the grace of God, we try to. So, be careful not to falsify facts. I'll give you a few more examples. In, uh, we, ha we have an iconographer in our church who's a monk who's painting an icon of St. John Maximovich, St. John of San Francisco, in an OCA church. And one of the older members of the church uh, was, was upset about it. And when he saw the icon, he said, why are you putting a schismatic on our wall? That's how people saw Rokor. Um, you can misrepresent it all you want, but all the patriarchates recognized the patriarchate of Moscow under Metropolitan Sergius. Although the Patriarchate of Serbia and the Patriarchate of Jerusalem had some sympathies towards Rokor, still, eventually, they cut communion. There was a time when they didn't have intercommunion. And I know this from people, from monastics, who lived in Jerusalem. Uh, they told me that they never concelebrated the Rokor clergy and the Patriarchate the clergy of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem never concelebrated. There was an intercommunion at the level of the lay people, <clears throat> but it never got to the uh, to the point where the clergy concelebrated. So this is um, this is significant because today um, <clears throat> there's a little bit of a different view about the history of Rokor. Um, now, after so much time has passed, it's People just don't want to um, see St. John Maximovich as a schismatic with good reason, because he's a great saint of the church. He's one of the greatest saints of our last century. But um, you can't rewrite history. It is what it is. And St. John Maximovich uh, felt very strongly about what I'm talking about here. There were two particular things in Rokor which stood out and um, which I think we should point out. The first is that the Rokor hierarchy absolutely insisted that they could not come into communion with the Moscow Patriarchate until the Moscow Patriarchate repented. I repeat, they would not join the Moscow Patriarchate until the Moscow Patriarchate repented. I already mentioned about this um, statue. The second thing, which was stressed, was they were optimistic. They had great hopes that Russia would be liberated and that the church would be free again and that there would be a czar. And I truly hope, and I have the same optimism, perhaps one day the Lord will clear all this up, and I don't think it's a joy. It shouldn't be a joy. For some people it is a joy on both sides that we are not in communion. It's sad for us that the ancient patriarchates right now um, are preaching something quite different from what the fathers of the church preached. We could talk about that in a subsequent video, but already there's a lot of information out about that. We're talking about two distinct different voices. The voice of St. Mark of Ephesus, the voice of the modern modernist bishop. Voice of St. Gregor Palmas, the voice of the modern, modernist bishop. And there's a lot of them. 
there are a lot of modernistic heretical bishops. Um, so we brought up examples in the previous video of holy people. And there are a lot more. And Rokor felt this kinship with the Greek old counters, because actually the Greek old counters had a few. It was not totally all of them. Definitely we had some, some issues for a while. But there were a few very holy men who were miracle workers. And I'm talking about really serious miracle workers. But if you were to read their lives, it would read as a life of a saint. <clears throat> There's a little bit of a piece of inform a little piece of information that I'd like you to know as well. Um, Father Ephraim, Elder Ephraim of Arizona, also called us. He called my predecessor, Metropolitan Pavlos, years back. And um, I have a clergyman who was present, who was a witness. He was actually in the room when Elder Ephraim called Metropolitan Pavlos to ask him if he could be received into the GOC. Um, probably, if he went ahead with that, if he were to join us, you'd prob you probably would have seen the document coming out from him about our canonicity. You probably would have defended it. Because it is a fact that during the lifetime of, of Elder Frem, he did go back and forth a number of times. And also, um, when he came to America, he came through our parishioners, uh, people who belong to our parish in Canada, in Montreal, um, and they still belong to our parish. And he didn't uh, he didn't tell them no, don't go there because they're schismatics. Um, he knew a lot of our people. Sometimes he would send people to us. Sometimes he would send people to confess to some of our clergy. Anyway. That is, that is what happened. The Rokor got, went to the point where they even believed some of the bishops. I, it wasn't all of them, and it wasn't all the people, but a lot of people in Rokor, especially in the catacomb church, especially as time progressed, because at the beginning, you know, you're trying to figure things out. A lot of people said that the Moscow Patriarch was graceless. Of course, the Moscow Patriarch had said concerning the catacomb church that they were graceless. They were anathematizing each other, but the truth was on one side. The thing that really surprises me, though, is that, and I don't know if you can find this anywhere in the history of the Church, people who claim to be Orthodox so venomously and aggressively opposed to those who are actually saying the same thing with regards to communism being a heresy, and a lot of, at least up to a certain point, were saying the same thing. And uh, just saying, oh, they're all schismatics. Well, the ones who came from Rokor are not. And the Rokor, even the Rokor MP, knows very well who they are, who we are. There are others, quite frankly, who are uh, break, -off, break off groups from the new calendar, modernistic jurisdictions, and they just sort of set up shop and they treat the church as their own personal franchise, and then they call themselves GOC, with absolutely no relation to us. And so somehow, their schismatic groups, they're connecting with us. No, they don't belong to us. They belong to you. They're schismatic groups of the, of the new calendars groups. So I think one needs to, as I said in the beginning, one needs to be very careful, lest we sin. Let us be more cautious with our words. Let us be more spiritual about our outlook. Let us listen to what the saints have said. And in my own personal experience, I've known holy people who I believe to be saints for many good reasons. And uh, they, were, they were sanctified in the GOC. If you really feel that orthodoxy is the truth, and if you really feel that the pan-heresy that we're dealing with today truly is a pan-heresy, which is a different term. Father Justin Popovich called it a pan-heresy. I, I, I don't know if we've ever called a heresy a pan-heresy in the past. I don't think so. So this is a unique situation. The Church is dealing with a very unique situation today. Think about it. And um, 
rather than just thinking like a lawyer or a scribe or a Pharisee, humble your heart, go on your knees, pray about it, ask the Lord for illumination, and you'll see something very different. You'll be a lot more careful with what you say. Don't um, misinterpret things and be very careful with uh, hurling accusations like, you know, this really strange accusation because, as I said, I don't know if there's ever, ever been a time where you see this aggressiveness from people who say that they're orthodox against the people who are confessing orthodoxy. So they have to come up with something. So they're saying that we are Donatists. How in the world do you make that connection? Actually, um, sometimes I think that um, there are people in the modernistic jurisdictions that are Donatists, and I'll tell you why. Or at least more so. It could, it could apply to them a lot more so. <clears throat> the Fathers always say that there's a difference between sin and heresy. We have so many examples of that. And here we're putting this Donatist claim. For those of you who don't know what Donatism is, you're going to have to look it up. Um, heresy is a totally different level. And the purpose for this separation is heresy, what we believe to be heresy. Um, now, there are people in the modernistic jurisdictions who basically say, no, these people, us, are schismatics, but we'll accept Elder Euronymous as a saint. Well, that sounds a little more linked to Donatism to me. No, but he was in communion with us. You're lying. You are lying. He was sympathetic, but he was not under the New Calendar Church. Our bishops buried him. Our bishops gave him communion. The priest who was his priest in Egina for years just reposed a few months ago in his 90s. He's our priest, Father Ignatius Bafas. <clears throat> God rest his soul. <clears throat> All he did was talk about Elder Hieronymus, Saint Hieronymus, his whole life, miracle after miracle after miracle. No, he was totally under our bishops. And quite frankly, at a time which was a little more ambiguous, because we still didn't have at that time the official recognition of Rokor. The official recognition from Rokor came a few years later. But still, there was the unofficial recognition of Rokor before the official recognition of Rokor, meaning the documents which came out from Rokor stating that we are sister churches. Before that, we had, of course, Vladika Leonti, St. John Maximovich, Vladika Verki, Vladika Nektari, Vladika Sava, all came to my cathedral. And St. John came a number of times, and he stood on the throne, and he prayed with us. He's blessed, he blessed our cathedral, and, and through our cathedral, our entire metropolis. So, please do not lie. May the Lord give us understanding in all things, and may the Lord open up our minds and our hearts to at least be a little more open to the truth. The prayers of our saints, the saints of our days. May the Lord protect us all from evil and unite us to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Amen.